After completing dozens of projects this year, my scrap pile has gotten pretty big. I tend to be a bit of a hoarder when it comes to scraps, so today I'm going to try to put some of those to good use. I'm going to be building an ingrain cutting board with some of my scraps and cutoffs, and then I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'll be making a special blue epoxy light with some walnut for my son, and we've convinced him that this is a special light that keeps the monsters away. So if you want to see how I built it, then stick around. Wow! Wow! It keeps the monsters away. I've done a number of ingrain cutting boards on this channel, so I'm going to fly through this one pretty quick. I guess what's different about trying to make a cutting board out of the scraps that you have is rather than starting out with a design in your head and making the wood fit your design, you have to look at the wood that you have and come up with a design to fit the wood. So I took the walnut and maple scraps that I had and went to town. There's a couple of different ways you could go about doing this. I decided to thickness plane everything to the same thickness and then cut the boards up to various widths that could be pleasing to the eye. Now you'll notice that I'm dealing with shorter pieces here so I'm having to do the glue up in two separate batches with the intention that they're going to be interlaced together in a later step. Once the two sets of glued up boards were dry, I ran both of them through the thickness planer. This is just to accelerate this particular step. If you don't have a planer, you can just use a radial orbital sander. I just find that the planer makes it go a lot faster. Once that was done, I set my table saw to 1 and 5 eighths and began ripping strips from the two boards that I just got done planing. I then arranged the newly cut strips on the parallel clamps, making sure to interlace strips from the two different boards so that the pattern doesn't repeat itself. If you had cut all your strips from the same board design, another option is to flip every other board the other way around, just so that you don't have a repeating pattern and it looks a little bit more interesting. After the second glue up, it then comes time to route, sand, and prepare the board for finishing. I don't go into detail about that in this particular video, but I've got a couple other videos that you can look at if you want to see more detail about how I do this. To finish the board, I use a generous amount of mineral oil and watch the board come to life. And here you can see those scraps being put to really good use. Now ingrain cutting boards are a little bit more time intensive because you've got two rounds of glue ups and ingrain cutting boards require a lot of sanding. But if you're willing to invest the time, this is a really good idea, not only for home use around the kitchen, but these make great gifts for friends and family. For the second project, I was looking for a creative and unique way to use some of the smaller scrap cutoffs that I have left over from other projects. I have a hard time throwing away nice, beautiful wood because I think in the back of my mind, I might use it sometime in the future. So as I was creating this in my shop, my son walked out and saw me making this thing and he didn't know what it was. So my wife and I convinced him that this is a special light that scares away all the monsters. So as long as you have this light in your room, you're protected from the monsters and you can sleep peacefully. We'll see if that works. To create the design, I started off by making one inch by one inch boards. Now I'm using a combination of a table saw and a planer to make this, but you could just use a table saw if you didn't have a planer. 
I then cut those into smaller pieces, ranging from two inches all the way up to seven inches, and I began gluing them together in random patterns to create a little bit of artistic flair. Once both pieces were dry, I finally got a feel for what this piece would look like once it was finished and how I wanted to arrange the two different pieces. With that in mind, I then began to build the mold that was going to hold the epoxy. Now, if you had melamine, that would be a great choice. I didn't have any melamine, so I decided to take some half-inch plywood and just cover it with some Tyvek tape or some tuck tape. Off camera, I also added some caulking on the inside corners, and then I went back and taped the outside. I have PTSD after watching John Malecki's video where he was doing a waterfall table and didn't get a good seal on his form and epoxy leaked all over his shop. So I took the conservative route of running a bead of caulk on the inside of the form and taping the outside. Probably overkill, but better safe than sorry. I'll be using liquid glasses, two to four inch thick epoxy today, coupled with some cobalt blue pigment to give it a really nice metallic blue look to it. Now it's advertised as a two inch to four inch thick pour, but given that my mold is gonna be a full four inches thick, I've decided to take it in two separate pours. The risk here is that if you try to make everything in one deep pour, as it's curing, the epoxy can get really hot and crack and ruin your project, and then you have to start all over again. So I wasn't pressed for time with this particular project, so I decided to do it in two different pours. If you do this, make sure that when you are adding coloring to your epoxy, that all of your batches have the same amount of pigment added so that you don't have variations in color between different pours. You'll notice here in my mold that I've got two pieces of walnut that are surrounded in Tyvek tape that are clamped down on the project. This seems a little bit counterintuitive, but as you're pouring the resin, your wood actually becomes buoyant in the epoxy, and it can actually cause your project to shift. So make sure that you've got really good clamp down pour so that your project doesn't move. After letting the first pour cure overnight, I then come back the next day to make mix up an identical batch to the first one and make the second pour. If you have any surface air bubbles remaining, you can take a lighter or a blowtorch and just pop those bubbles really quickly. After giving the resin the better part of a week to cure, it came time to get this out of the mold. Now because I was using Tyvek tape, I don't expect a lot of resistance to get this thing out. I found that taking a rubber mallet to the edge pieces to break the mold worked the most effective. The hardest piece to get off was actually the bottom piece because there was almost a suction type effect. So I ended up using a flathead screwdriver almost as a wedge just to get it away from the bottom of the project. You may notice me wearing a work shirt in this particular video. I got so excited after I came home from work that I just wanted to bust it out of the mold and see what it looked like. I then used my planer to help clean up some of the edges. Again, if you don't have a planer, you can use a radial orbital sander for this part. Planer just makes it go faster.
during the epoxy pour, I did get a little bit of epoxy behind the edge of the project, so I used my crosscut sled to put a nice fresh edge on both sides of the project. It seems like no matter how meticulous you are with the epoxy and the curing process and popping bubbles, you're going to be left with some voids in your project. You could choose to fill those with epoxy and wait another four or five days before sanding. Uh, you can also use some CA glue with some activator and that seems to cure really quickly. It is, It does dry clear so it's not going to be the same color as your epoxy, but for small holes and pits that you're trying to fill it works just fine. With all the holes in the epoxy filled, it was time to go over to my downdraft table and begin sanding. This downdraft table was built into my workshop bench a number of months ago, and I use it all the time. I like that it adds the functionality of a downdraft table in the shop without adding any additional footprint. To use it, I just simply hook up my four inch quick connect on my dust right system, and I'm good to go. If you wanna see how I built it, I'll leave a link in the description. I had to do the sanding for this project in two different steps. I worked my way through the various grits to get all the way up to 320, just like I would on a normal project. And then there was a subsequent step that I took to help polish the epoxy. So there is a set of polishing pads that I bought off of Amazon that are very small, that allow you to polish small project epoxy up to a high luster. The color chart that you see here is the equivalent grit that each of the pad represents. So I worked my way all the way up to the highest, which is 12,000. You certainly wouldn't want to use this on a larger project like a desk or a table, but for a smaller project like this, it's perfect. To finish this project, I'll be using Rubio Monocoat in the pure oil finish. I've used this on a number of projects recently and I've gotten really addicted to how easily this finish goes on and how hard it is to mess up. You simply trowel it on in reasonable quantities and then you buff it off making sure not to leave any sticky residue left on the piece. Once it's done, the finish cures over the next seven days. but Unlike a finish like polyurethane, you can handle it right away if you need to. It's best to leave it alone, but I've had to move projects shortly after applying the finish and never have had any issues. Now because I mixed up the epoxy in such a dark color, light was having a hard time getting through, so I decided to bore out a hole using a one and a half inch spade bit just to help light get down a little bit deeper. I also wanted the LED puck to sit flush on the bottom, so I decided to take my palm router and trim out a circle to where it could sit flush in a recess. Last step was just to add a few rubber feet, and we were done. Ready for the reveal. Andy? Andy, that light will keep the monsters away. How cool are you going to touch it? Wow. Wow. Wow, Andy. You want to see it up close? Here. Whoa, do you see the blue? Whoa. And that? What is that? Is that wood? So these are just two ideas of things that you could do with scraps. I'm probably going to have a couple of these videos coming out because I always have too many scraps. And it's always a good feeling whenever you can make someone's day or night just a little bit better. Kylie's got a reaction from you. You looking at it? Keeps the monsters away. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. <laughs>